Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Matt O'Lean. On this edition of Prairie Mosaic, we'll meet Fargo painter Karen Maki, see a segment from the Women Behind the Plow documentary, and hear music from Natalie Fiddler. The Staub Church, which stands just outside the MCOM Center in Moorhead, is a magnificent combination of modern building techniques and old-time Norwegian church construction. I like to smell a pine. And I satisfied that we got it started and we got it finished and it's still standing and people seem to enjoy coming here. So there's a lot of satisfaction in that. Guy Paulson in the mid-1990s was nearing retirement age or, and, and uh, he wanted a retirement project, I think. <laughs> Style churches are really fascinating pieces of architecture. Around the year 1000, the Vikings convert to Christianity. The Scandinavians, the Norse culture, give up Odin, Thor, Loki, their old gods, and they have to build churches for this new religion they joined up with. Everywhere else at this time in Europe, it was the age of the giant stone cathedrals being built up to the sky. In Scandinavia, this was a culture of carpenters, they're woodworkers. So these are wooden translations of medieval stone cathedrals. These are called stav churches or stave churches because of the construction technique. The word stav, S-T-A-V, in Scandinavian languages means an, a vertical piece of wood, an up and down piece of wood. The scary Scandinavian barbarians become Europeans and we're watching that happen in a building right here. So it, even though this doesn't look like any building we've ever been in before, maybe it looks more like Lord of the Rings or something. It's still a medieval basilica church. It's got the nave where the people stand and they, everybody stood for church back then. You take a step up to the altar where the altar is, that's the chancel. It's got a row of windows called the clear story. This is the recipe to make a medieval church. It's just made out of wood. The idea came many years before I retired. In fact, sort of drove my wife nuts because I wouldn't drop it. But about 10 years or so before that, and you ask, why did I get interested? Well, there are a variety of reasons. Number one, my father was probably most instrumental. He was born in Norway, about uh, 100 kilometers or so north and east of the Hofstede Church in a place called Jostedal. And I started reading books about Stav churches, and the idea didn't go away, so I figured the time had come to retire and do something. I retired in 95, and most of 96 was working with architects, getting plans from the Norwegians, and deciding how we were going to go about it. Actual building on site, I started carving for all the parts that had to be incorporated as we build it. I started that in about January of 97, and then I worked steady on that all through 97, and then in the summer of 97, they started building on site, and then the basic structure was built and completed in about June of 98, and that's when the dedication was. So it was about five and a half, six years from beginning to end. On the inside, in the nave where the people are, there's a beautifully carved baldachin. Baldachins are kind of canopies over altars. There's four heads carved on it. We have Jesus on top, uh, the, probably the king and queen of Norway uh, below that. And the fourth person, we don't know who he is, but we know he's a monk from his haircut. The paintings tell the Christmas story. And the chancel where the priest would stand is the leper's window. If you're sick, you're not allowed inside to get everybody else sick. 
but you don't want to stay home from church because if you're about to die of the plague, you want those sins checked off your record before you go. So you come to get your communion through the drive through window. Outside, you'll see a lot of dragons mixed in with the Christian crosses. And, you know, if you tell a Viking to put a gargoyle on top of their church, they put the dragon off the prow of a Viking ship. So they have very Viking gargoyles on the outside. The front door carvings took Guy Paulson about a year to carve. Putting the church here, adding it to the Yomkamp's Viking ship has really made this an international destination for Norwegian American heritage. We are a little county historical society in Northwest Minnesota, but we're more than that now. We have busloads of Norwegians coming here. Just last week, there was a busload of Norwegians that I toured through this. We have so many Norwegians coming in that we have our films subtitled in Norwegian for them. We've had quite a few visitors here from Norway. There was one family that came here and their daughter was married here and they were very complimentary as Norwegians usually are. I think they appreciate it. It is what it is. We did what we did and we were happy with it. Had a lot of fun building it. If they didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be happy about it, but they say they are. <laughs> I survived the deal and it worked out. Yeah, it worked out really well. Craftsmanship isn't dead. I don't get tired of being in this building. I, I, I look at these, uh, I, I look at how it's put together. I'm a wood carver myself, a woodworker myself, and so I, it's really an inspiration to me. Mr. Paulson is an inspiration. It's American ingenuity. Machines can't do better than a guy with a chisel and a mallet who knows how to use it. Karen Bakke is a top-selling painter who lives in Fargo. Last summer, she spent a week at Fort Stevenson State Park near Garrison, North Dakota, where she was the featured artist in residence. I took art as a sloth class, something easy, and that was when I was 13, and who knew that that was my career? My name is Karen Bakke. I am an artist, fine artist, mural artist. I've been doing it for 42 years professionally. I sold paintings or drawings at the age of seven because my dad bought them. <laughs> I wanted to go to the candy store and, Dad, I have a painting. And so he would buy my drawings for a nickel and a quarter and a dime. This needs to be cooler, so I put a little blue in this line here. I pretty much paint everything because I like to eat. This is my sole income, <laughs> and it always has been. I just think it's good to grow and paint everything because every time you do something different, you're going to learn. I really enjoy painting animals. I did portraits for a while because if you can do a portrait well, you can do a landscape then. My painting actually mirrors my life. Typically my palettes are colorful and my art sometimes it's impressionistic but much more realistic and that's what I am. The North Dakota Council on the Arts gives our department funding to host these artists. And it's essentially putting these artists to work. We provide lodging and we provide promotions of their artwork and their events. And they're being supported by getting people to come in and see what they do and to be able to give them a venue to share that. And I think that's pretty amazing. As the parks, what we get out of it is we get potential new user groups, we get people to our parks, and we get some beautiful artwork because as part of the program, the artists donate a piece of their work that reflects their residency. It's really a nice opportunity for both the parks and the artists just to come to the park with nothing else to do but paint, no other obligations. I really enjoy coming by myself because there's so much solitude. I can put all of my thoughts into that painting. 
I will do a one-hour presentation and just tell them about my work and what I've been doing here and how I've portrayed the state park. Because we want to promote not only art, but you want to promote the state and its parks and let people know it's really nice out here. People have different ways they connect with the outdoors, art being one of them. This is yet another attraction that we can have at our state parks that attract a different user group to our state parks. That's pretty awesome. It is nice to have a photo, but the plein air painting or the painting outdoor from life, it's top-notch training. It's like hitting the elliptical as hard as you can go. It really taxes your brain, so about two hours and mentally I'm just wiped. I am hoping that through my art and some of the paintings that maybe someone will think twice about walking down a path because I try to find things that people pass by. Rain or shine, I'm out there in the mist and the rain getting what I can. Karen's work is amazing. I'll be the first one to tell you that I am not an artist. I don't speak their lingo but I have a true appreciation for it. I look at Karen's work and Karen celebrates life, life in the form of plants or animals, and she's able to bring a ceiling to life through a mural, a wall to life, and that just amazes me. Karen's worked with us a few times and she's amazing with the public, all ages. Okay, so I'm gonna give you watercolor paper. Um, oh, I guess you need paint. Okay, how you doing? Oh, that's much better. When I took art in high school, it was take a picture and copy the picture. and. That's two-dimensional, and when you're looking at the real person or the real animal, it's three dimensions and you see so much more. I'm all about growing, getting better, learning something new, get out of your comfort zone, so a lot of times I'm saying, yikes! <laughs> I kind of have an attitude where I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to go after it. So I fail a lot, but I'm going to mess up until I don't mess up. <laughs> I'm going to fail until I don't fail. Being a woman in the male-dominated field of agriculture can be difficult. Emily and Joyce Cher tell us about their experiences in an excerpt from Prairie Public's documentary, Women Behind the Plow. I always wanted animals, and so my dad told me I should marry a farmer. And I married a farmer, and we moved to Zealand in November of 1979, and we started out with 25 cows. I had to learn everything. I didn't know what I was doing, basically. How long to milk the cows, how to feed calves. I grew up in a home where there were three girls, so coming to a family where there was all boys, it was hard for them to adjust to a girl wanting to be outside and work. And so I think that was probably my biggest issue was I felt like I had to prove myself all the time. I believe it's changed because I believe there are more women that are in agriculture now that have bit the bullet and just done it. I think that back when I was younger, it was a scary thing. And I think that when things happen to people's husbands, I don't know how many women actually stayed on the farm. I think now that men have adjusted to the fact that women can farm, I could totally see any one of my girls farming because of what they were taught. We have three daughters, Alicia, Kristen, and Emily. They worked hard. They all had to feed calves. I would say by the time they could walk, they probably held a bottle in their hand to feed calves. We always told them that we could have never farmed if they wouldn't have helped. 
After Tom passed away, we were very fortunate that the farm was paid for. There were people that thought I should sell out. They didn't know what I wanted here, but this is our home. We were on this farm for 34 and a half years together. I don't know where else I'd want to be right now. As far as men in the community, I have my handful of men who were totally awesome that came to help and still come to help. No questions. Pretty much let me make the decisions, but are always there to help if I need help. She is actually a crop adjuster and she's always been my go-to person in the last three and a half years. She comes home and helps me do things. After Tom passed away, she put the hay down for me and I bailed it. So we're kind of a team and her goal someday is to farm this farm. Growing up on my family farm was interesting. Uh, I would have not wanted to grow up any other way. I loved it. It taught me discipline. It taught me how to nurture baby animals. It taught me everything in my life and I would have not wanted to grow up in any other way. I want to take over the farm. I'm definitely going to have to have another job to do this. Health insurance is a big deal. It boggles my mind how expensive it is for something that people need in life. So to have a job that will either A, pay for it, or B, help you pay for it, will make life 100 times easier. And with my crop adjusting job, it's pretty flexible. So I can still help in the field. I can still help plant if we're not busy. I can still fix fence, do all of those things, but yet I still have a job that I will be able to collect a paycheck and help with bills and all of that stuff. If a young man's coming back to farm, what's his wife supposed to do? Because if he's coming home to a 500 acre farm, there's no way that they can both farm. She's gonna need a job. And you usually have to drive 25, 30 miles for that job. It is very hard to be a woman in agriculture. It was an adjustment to be a woman in agronomy because dealing with old German farmers who are stern in a way and Roundup's gonna kill everything and I don't need all this other stuff, it's hard to explain to them that you can't spray Roundup all the time. It's gonna become resistant. We need to make a different plan and for them to listen to a 21-year-old girl who's just came out of college is very hard. I wish that I would have more women to look up to in the agriculture world. So I'm hoping that I can be a big part of that. My best friends, I hope that they have little girls who want to farm or marry a farmer and at least be able to say, well, I got to drive a tractor today, that was my job. One person said to me one time that, I don't understand how you can farm. You put so much money into it and you don't get anything back. And I just laughed and I said, people don't farm to be rich. People farm because they love it. Natalie Fiddler is a fun-loving and talented alternative pop music performer and composer. The Moorhead performer shines with selections from her new EP, Steak and Eggs. For your car, the headlights pull up and we shout, Thank you, God, as you put up, pull up, show up, I'll never be your girl. As much as I'd like to, you're too far inside yourself. The war between my lungs can only be so by our breathing coexisting. You used to be my safety. in our number so count your blessings as they leave choices made after midnight never come cheap i'm ringing my hands hoping you'll ring the doorbell and curl back with apologies tell me not to worry that the voices in my head are all made up but just like dumbledore said by a wood in my head me
stay in the theaters, but I'd vote like you on Solar Movie and I'll watch you in my underwear from the comforts of my home. You're the type of credit I wouldn't go for unless you satisfy two poor requirements, meaning that I just might graduate on time. Top a t-shirt I only sport when all my favorite ones are in the wash. The top of CD I only pull out during boring road trips. But I like awful movies and outfits that don't match. Dusty beer eats CDs and deficient credit sex. So I guess you just might be my type. Straining my eyes and keeping me up so late. I'll break the top of silence that I can't find comfort in. For a brief moment of adrenaline that leaves me at your feet. You're the top of movie, the top of credit, the top of t shirt CDs, the baby grand, the guppy man, the headache in the silence. You're the top of movie, the top of credit, the top of t-shirt, CD, the baby friends, the guppy man, the headache in the silence. But I like midnight ravings about my trashy love. And I hope someday you'll swim over and tell me what you're thinking of. And what is your type of love? If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. You can watch this and other episodes of Prairie Mosaic on Prairie Public's YouTube channel and follow Prairie Public on social media as well. I'm Matt O'Lean. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.